I'm going to give you a very brief uh, introduction to the two stellar people to my right uh, to leave as much time as possible to talk. Dr. David G. Marwell has had a distinguished career in public history. He spent nine years at the U.S. Department of Justice, where as Chief of Investigative Research, he conducted research in support of the investigation and prosecution of Nazi war criminals in the United States. As a part of this effort, he played major roles in the Klaus Barbie and Joseph Mengele investigations and helped to author the two major reports that resulted. He is also the author of Mengele, Unmasking the Angel of Death. And immediately to my right, Dr. Rebecca Erbelding is a historian of the United States and the Holocaust and the author of the authoritative history of the War Refugee Board, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. She's also a historian, as you know from watching the play. She is also a historian, educator, curator, and former archivist at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where her work on the Carl Hawker album drew the attention of the entire world, including Moises Kaufman, who scheduled an interview with her, and then several more, the result of which is this play. Thank you both for being here tonight. Yeah, and you're gonna... I'm... I am going to be as um, keen an observer as all of you. I'm going to ask one question, and then I'm going to hand the mic over. But I want to jump right into the subject. Um, you know, a line that uh, sticks out in this play is that genocides have occurred many times before, but this was, the, this was one led by the doctors. Uh, and I'll also note that your alter ego on stage, and presumably um, you mentioned that the first person you recognized in the album was Joseph Mengele, having written a paper on him. Um, please, uh, I'm dying to hear more about the role of doctors in this. Uh, that story is true. Um, we received the album in the winter of 2007, and my job at the museum was to work with survivors, some of whom are actually here tonight. So I'm I'm so grateful for them. We've had a long relationship. I they have been through this process with me that you saw on stage, um, and so my job was to meet with people to evaluate whether something was was fit within the museum's collection, and then to, as they say in the play, shepherd the collection through, make sure we have all the information that we're making it available to scholars. And I looked through the album once, it was, once we received it, didn't see any prisoners, went up to my now husband's office, um, and was looking through the album again and said, Yes, that's Mengele. I had written an undergraduate paper on him, and largely not so much on his work at Auschwitz, but on the memory of Mengele, on how people look at him when he is not the only doctor at Auschwitz. I mean, in this play, Edward Wirtz is a main character, and he was, he was actually senior to Mengele at the camp. There are other doctors who are also appearing in the album, um, most notably Carl Klauberg, who was famous for his medical experimentation on, on women and fertility. Um, brutal, brutal man also shows up in the album. Also, Edvard Munch, who um, is a figure not dissimilar to Wirtz, a very complicated man. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is kind of how that happened. We started by identifying some of the doctors and some of the major figures, and they are everywhere. They were absolutely integral to running the camp. I'm curious, David, I know I want to get to Gabe's question, but also we didn't show you the album before we went public with it. And so I want to know what, how you found out about it and what you saw. Well, this is a confession uh, that I did see. Uh, <gasps> Um, can I say that now? Yeah, I don't know. You can yeah. Say that now. <laughs> well, we we had a, a uh, one of our uh, uh, one of the things missing from your introduction, which I will forgive you for, but it 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 accounts for one of the really greatest jobs I ever had, which was I was the associate director at the Holocaust Museum, and I supervised the operation that is depicted here. Uh, part of my responsibilities, Ju Judy Cohen was one of my my uh, one of my colleagues and. Uh, so it was, feels kind of uh, to be at home here a little bit here. Yeah, you had left just before I came, before so we didn't came. overlap. We yeah. didn't overlap, but other small. People, other people did. <laughs> okay. Small fact: we are actually neighbors, and we yes. had to come to San Diego. I never yeah. see, I never see Rebecca at home, but I see her here. <laughs> yeah, we fly across uh, the world. So I did see a copy. Uh, one of our our colleagues from the museum uh, came up to. I was the director of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City. And uh, Ray came to um, visit me, and she took out of her bag a folded up 
photocopy of the album, um, and it was a pretty exciting and, and important, it was long before I thought about writing a book about Mengele, but I had worked on the investigation, the, the, the search for Mengele in, in 1985. So it had a significant meaning for me when I saw it. I wonder, as somebody who did war crimes investigations, one of the things that I've always wondered about with this album is, what if it had come to light earlier? Would Carl Hawker have been able to make the denials that he had if this album had come to light earlier? And I wonder, as someone who has done war crime, or who did war crimes investigations for so long, you see, I'm assuming, this album in a different light than I do. What, what do you see in that Yeah, play? well, sadly, um, because of the nature of the German judicial system, um, people like Herker were, were really not um, considered to be, uh, they, they were never tried for murder, they were only tried for, for accessory to murder. Um, and um, I imagine this would have been a probative piece of evidence for us um, had, had we known about it and seen it beforehand. Um, yeah, one of the one of the things that that we don't or that that the playwrights did not add in the play is that the lieutenant colonel, the the man who donated the collection to the museum, was actually stationed in Frankfurt during Hawker's trial, and oh. so I'm assuming that he had the album stowed away at home in the United States, did not look at it, did not think about it, but the Frankfurt trial was front page news for more than two years. And so Hucker's image and the image of some of the other doctors and other aides um, were on the front page. And I, I always wonder whether he kind of, whether that guy looked familiar to so him. So did he actually, then he served there in 1946 and then he, then he went somewhere yeah. else and then he was reassigned? That's yeah, and then he was yeah. assigned to Frankfurt. And yeah. so um, we, Judy and I actually, after, after um, the Lieutenant Colonel passed away, um, we were able to go into his house and to look around. <laughs> um, he didn't have any family surviving him and we convinced the executor of the estate that the material that he had donated to us, the photograph album, was so significant that what if there were other things? Um, and so we went and we, as we call it, liberated about 90 pounds of paper material, including interrogation manuals, um, German dictionaries, and all of his letters home Wow. in the late 1940s and in his time in Frankfurt in the 60s. And we wanted to look through them to say, does he say somewhere, oh, I found this weird album. You know, this is what it, this is right. what it is. And he never does. Um, it's very frustrating. So did he give you any more information about the no. album? So, so he... No, I mean, the caginess that's in the show is the caginess in real life. Wow. Um, we, when we were going through his house, I think I can say this now, you, you all won't tell. Um, <laughs> when we were going through his house, we actually found his day planner from, that, from the year that he died. So from the year that he came to the museum, uh -huh. met with us. And he wrote and he said, um, entertained you know, eight Holocaust Museum historians for a few hours. That was his thing. And I was like, that is wow. how he thought about it actually, is like yeah. he entertained us with his stories, did not answer any questions really, um, and then went home probably very delighted with himself for having done this. Right. And I, I can only be grateful to him. A lot of people, including the playwrights, kept asking, why do you think he did this? Why do you think he held on to it? Why? And there, you can speculate a whole host of reasons. The most benign is that it was a souvenir from the war, the way that lots of people took home things they found interesting after the war. Um, but I can do nothing but be grateful to him for giving it to us when he did because everything in his home was getting destroyed. You know, and that was, he died four months later. We were four months away from losing it. Um, and, and that's the thing, if there's one takeaway about this, I know we've gotten away from the issue of doctors, but if there's one takeaway from all of this, it's if you find letters in your closet, don't just throw them out because you don't read the language. Like, Museums, archives, we are happy to say no, but we want to be asked. Um, you know, we'll be able to help you figure out whether this is something significant, but if it's destroyed, it's gone forever. So please don't let that happen. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'll just project now. Oh, no. <laughs>
That's great. But I, thank you. Um, and there's a whole host, there, there's 18 different talks we could have with you, all of which <laughs> we would be delighted to have. But to return to the subject, um, this, this awful irony of, of doctors that, um, that first do no harm, the, the Hippocratic Oath, and to not only go against that, but to lead um, this extraordinary uh, atrocity. Just what in your, I, I guess, so, Dr. Marwell. If, so I would, I would say um, there, there are physicians in Nazi Germany um, executed a kind of um, moral sleight of hand by being able in their own minds to remain faithful to the Hippocratic Oath by a simple substitution that the object of care was not the individual, not the patient, not the person that was before them, but it was this racial community and um, their, their focus of, their, of, of the healing was to heal the racial community, which meant that if the person before them was considered a threat, um, then you could, the same way, and there's, that you would remove a finger that was uh, diseased to protect the hand or an arm to protect the body, you could um, do away with um, an imminent threat to the racial quality of, the, of, the, of this um, uh, Volksgemeinschaft, which is the German term, the Nazi term for, for this community of race and nation. And so that allowed them to carry out their daily activities um, and not feel that they were in some ways contradicting the, the, um, the Hippocratic Oath. They were actually doing something positive in their minds. Well, and this wasn't limited to Germany. Yep. I mean, Germany takes it to an extreme, but if you think about the eugenics movement in the United States in the 19-teens and 20s and in Great Britain, that results in things like Buck versus Bell, the Supreme Court ruling that said that the state could forcibly sterilize people. And that was on the books until I think the last person in the United States was forcibly sterilized in the 1970s and the last law was removed in 2014. And so the idea that, that there are people who are biologically better than others, that the state gets to determine that, and that doctors are then carrying out this idea of limiting the ability of people who are biologically inferior to reproduce. And threatening. And threatening because they will then have children, those children will be burdens on the state, those children will then reproduce themselves, it will bring the whole country down. That was the story of immigration restriction in the 1920s, it was the story of the Klan in the United States in the 1920s. Um, and Germany was having their own history with this. Um, Hitler isn't inspired by the United States, but they're drinking from the yeah. same well, the and same you, well of science. And uh, science. Joseph Mengele and his colleagues um, considered their work at Auschwitz to be a, a public, carrying out a public health function. Um, so that it was no accident that physicians were assigned this duty of so-called selection at the ramp. Part of it was um, an evaluation of the physical abilities of the people he was confronting to determine whether they could be exploited for their labor before they were sent to their death. But um, the association of doctors with the selection process really was so that, because it was considered to be a public health issue. And... Um, I think a lot of people have questions about the medical experimentations, and I'm wondering if that's something that you can address, yeah, like so, the validity of those. So, um, Mengele's chief responsibilities at Auschwitz were not, was not medical experimentation. In fact, he did that on his own, in his own spare time. Um, his main duty was, um, he was he was the camp physician initially at the at the so-called gypsy camp, was um, the sort of care of the inmate population. Now they didn't really care about the health of the inmate population, but the health of the inmate population had an impact on the public health of the entire camp um, complex. So that when there was a typhus epidemic, it threatened the SS guards and the SS families that lived in the area. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Mengele quite famously um, in Auschwitz um, 
designed a, a solution to a, the um, typhus epidemic that confronted him, him in the summer of 1943, which was to um, take one barracks and to remove all the people and to send them directly to the gas chambers. And then that barracks was completely fumigated and um, all the beds were changed and the people from the next barracks were then uh, deloused and fumigated and they went into the other barracks. And so they were able to kind of, uh, in series, um, completely rid the camp of, of this epidemic. And that was, he was noted in his performance appraisal for having done that. Um, no one asked him whether he could have just built a tent to bring people out and um, so, but his medical experiments, from Mengele's point of view, uh, Auschwitz offered a unique opportunity. Um, not only did it offer him a nearly um, exhaust uh, uh, a supply of subjects for experimentation that, that he could not possibly get to the end of, um, but it also offered him uh, people who could work under his direction, physicians and other medical professionals. So when, Aus when Mengele was on the ramp and was uh, calling, uh, making this decision whether people should be sent directly to their deaths or they should be exploited for their labor first, he was also making a call for any physicians or medical illustrators or nurses or anthropologists or others whom he could enlist in his efforts to carry out his, his experiments. He established at Auschwitz a kind of institute patterned on the one that he had been associated with in Frankfurt and then later in Berlin. Um, where the, and his interest in twins was the, an extension of the uh, twin research that was carried out, quite respectable twin research carried out by the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in, in, in uh, Berlin. Some of it funded uh, before the war by the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, twin research was considered to be the gold standard for, for genetic research. Uh, and Mengele, in, in my book I talk about the, the, the various areas that um, he was interested in. Um, the, the main key to his success in his own mind and this, this um, uh, amazing opportunity he had was that there were no barriers, no barriers to what he could do. Um, people sometimes don't believe that the protections for, for medical experimentation for subjects of experimentation in Germany before the war was, was considered a very highly uh, um, established and was actually a, a model for other countries. Um, but when you're dealing with the subjects of experiments who are not considered to be human beings, then all of the, the protections and, and um, limitations that are placed on doctors um, went away. So we had this supply of twins and of uh, people with other kinds of uh, uh, people that interested in people with growth anomalies, dwarfs and giants and um, heterochromia. People with two different color eyes was of significant interest to one of his colleagues at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute who studied this phenomenon of eye color and of interest to to her. Dr. Karen Magnuson was the the presence in some people of two different color eyes, um, and Mengele helped to acquire these eyes for, for Karen Magnuson so that she could um, um, examine them more closely, um, which meant the, the death of the people who, who was, whose eyes they were. Um, people often ask whether any of the experimentation that Mengele was involved in was useful, and I did find one series of experiments, one, one project that he was involved in at Auschwitz, which, which after the war was actually published, um, there was a disease at Auschwitz called Noma. It's a kind of oral cancer where the, the soft tissue in, in the face is eaten away. Um, and it, it had basically disappeared in, in the developed world um, in the 20th century. It still occurred in the developing world or among people with uh, uh, immune deficiencies. Uh, but there was an outbreak at the camp, um, in the gypsy camp, and Mengele decided he would try to find a, a, a a way to cure this disease. So he enlisted a very famous Czech pediatrician named Bertold Epstein, who had been in another part of the camp and had him brought to the gypsy camp and set him up in a barracks. 
um, he was able to acquire the medication that Dr. Uh, Epstein wanted. And Epstein developed a, um, a uh, protocol for treating this disease. The cause of the disease is basically malnutrition and poor sanitary conditions. So the first irony, the camp itself was the cause of the disease, and you could cure it by improving the conditions in the camp. But he found a, a, a medical um, protocol for, for curing the disease. Now, we know all of this because of one of the inmate physicians that was recruited by Mengele, who had really no choice but to work with him, um, was a displaced person in 1946, and she wrote an article for the British journal Lancet about Epstein and his protocol for, for curing Noma. Um, the second and ultimate irony of all this, of course, is that Epstein found a reasonable treatment for the disease, which reversed it, but the people who were cured by him were then murdered in the camp. So the, Question. I, I mean, one of the things we learned, uh, the, the really moving scene in the play where um, Peter Veers, um talks about his father and all of this evidence of um, the improvements that he strove to make in terms of the health of the, uh, of the prisoners and a, a prisoner begging him not to leave. So there are gradations. I mean, you know, again, we it's talk about relative. the diffusion of responsibility. So no one, well, the doctors were just, they were just making choices about who was fit to work. So coupled with what you're describing, Mengele, as um, sort of unadulterated, uh, there, there seem to be fewer shades of gray. Uh, is what I'm trying to delicately say. When your book is unmasking the angel of death, what did you find under the mask? Who, who is this person who ultimately I, made these uh, procedures? Was not my title. Um, <laughs> my title was deciphering the deciphering Mangala. Um, uh, Publishers got to publish. Yeah, but it was the the. Um, let me see how I can. Um. I mean, is it tr like uh, my assumption and my read on it has always been that there were physicians who struggled and there were physicians who did yeah. not, and Mengele did, does not seem to have. Mengele did not uh, struggle. He he uh, was ideologically committed to the Nazi vision. And there are lots of stories where um, there's a famous colleague of, of Mengele's, um, he's not famous, but the story's famous, who, um, when he was first assigned the, the task of selection, and selection was something that all of the physicians did. I mean, one, Munch claims that he, that he didn't, but it, uh, there's some dispute about that. Um, uh, one of his colleagues, uh, a young guy who went to Wirtz and said, I just can't do this. You can transfer me back to the front. I'm just not able to do it. And Wirtz said, hey, stick close to Mengele for a few days. You know, be his shadow. Just stay with him and um, you just do that. And he did. And he, was a, he a kind of accommodated himself to this, uh, got used to it in stages. Uh, he ended up committing suicide at, uh, at the end of the war, but um, so he showed uh, had some uh, reaction. And Wirtz, you know, this is the same Wirtz who made all the improvements, but he served on on the on the ramp. He did his own medical experiments um, on. Uh, he was a gynecologist, and and um, so it's true that Herman Longbein said that he was a good man, and. In contrast to others, he probably was, but this is a, a kind of skewed scale. Um, you know, Mengele um, never had his day in court. Um, he was never confronted formally with his crimes. But I, I write in the book about a significant confrontation he had at the end of his life. Uh, Mengele had a young, had a son that was born while Mengele was at Auschwitz. He met him 
uh, one time as, a, as an infant, and then he met him as a toddler when he was in hiding at the end of the, the war, and then he met him again in 1956 when he came to Europe from, from Argentina, where he had been f for about a decade. And, um, but the son never knew that, his, that Mengele was his father. He thought he was his uncle. And the son named Rolf decides and uh, learns at the time of the Auschwitz trial that Mengele is actually not his uncle Fritz, but his, his father. And, and Mengele's wife, who had divorced him and had remarried, said to Rolf, you have to write to your father. He's, he's, uh, he's very lonely, and he needs you to write to him. And, and this was a kind of forced correspondence that, that Rolf had to uh, undertake. And he carried on this correspondence for a very long time. Now, Rolf grew up in the, in the 60s in Germany. He was he had long hair. He was progressive in his politics and had no um, sympathy at all for what his father did, although he had this kind of sense that he was his father and there was some kind of connection there. So he decides, and, and the, the correspondence was very awkward. Uh, Rolf would write and Mengele uh, would, um, was a kind of a bully in the letters back to him. And Rolf finally decided, he, and, and Mengele would never respond to the direct questions about, uh, I mean, about that Rolf had posed about his, his career. So Rolf says he, he's going to go visit him. By this time, Mengele is in, in Brazil. So Rolf um, swipes a passport from one of his friends who looked like him. Um, he makes arrangements, he goes to Brazil, and he meets his father. And um, we know about this because Rolf has written about it, um, not published it, but we, I have things he's written about it. And I met Rolf in the course of the, of the investigation. And um, he wants to pin his father down and get him to explain what happened and how he could possibly have been involved in a place like Auschwitz. How is that possible that you could do that? Anyone who had anything to do in Rolf's mind with Auschwitz was tainted. And he goes through security procedures that his father dictated to him, and he meets his father, whom he had, hadn't seen since he was a teenager. And the father writes about this later, and he says, I, um, that this confrontation was very important to him because, of course, he was interested in the impact of, of um, legacy of, of genetics. And he was also interested in the impact of, of environment, because that's, of course, what twin experiments is all about, how you, how you tease out the impact of your genes versus or nature versus nurture. And uh, so he's confronting a man who's the same age he was when he went to Auschwitz. Mengele was 32 years old when he went to Auschwitz. And um, Rolf tries to get him, he confronts him, he says, well, what, how could you have done this? And Mengele gets angry at him and says, how could you believe all the stuff they write about me? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that person they're writing about. I never, I never killed anyone. I, I, uh, the people who I encountered on the ramp, they were already dead when they got there. And in fact, I saved some of them from death. All the twins who survived, I, I saved by pulling them out of the line where they would have gone right to the gas chamber. And I, I saved them, I gave them their purpose. Um, and Rolf just can't accept this. And they, they end up, uh, Mengele is weeping and Rolf is angry. And then they finally decide they can't continue. Rolf goes back to, to Germany and Mengele stews on this for a while, and then a couple of months later, he writes to Rolf and kind of reviews the visit. And he said, um, I, I've already tried to explain in an objective terms what my behavior, um, and I don't want to do it anymore, and I, I, I don't have any patience for this anymore. Um, if, um, and he goes on and on, but the last line is, uh, I draw the line um, when I see a threat to, to my family and to my Volksgemeinschaft, my racial community, which is the exact Nazi term that 
had kind of motivated him during his life, he, he hadn't progressed beyond in his thinking and his own self-reflection uh, beyond what he was in 1944. And so that's really the, the story of, of Mengele, although the world around him, of course, had progressed and the science that was his motivating factor had actually um, developed to a point where it, it absolutely proved the bankruptcy of his own theories. Um, so, sorry for that long answer. No, 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 thank you, thank you very much. And I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, but we, uh, we want to make time for some Q&A from the audience. So, uh, any questions for Drs. Erbelding or uh, Dr. Marwell, uh, please let us know. You've covered it all. Oh, yes, go ahead. And we're going to repeat uh, the question so everyone can hear it. I'm sorry, say again. She said when she was a clinical psychologist, one of her patients, he, Yeah, it's really interesting. So I, oh, sorry. Um, uh, clinical psychologist and Auschwitz survivor was saying that she uh, treated and worked with and befriended a patient who had been a twin, who had been experimented on uh, by Mengele, and that that person loved him, like remembered him very fondly. And that actually is, is repeated by other survivors, other child survivors. Um, that he delivered sweets to them sometimes, he was very nice to them sometimes. Um, and I think some of them did feed into this idea of he is the one, he is the reason I survived, I would not have survived without him. It is an incredibly complicated relationship that you would have with that piece of trauma, especially trauma that you are, that is occurring to you in your childhood um, without parents to have this kind of figure that is treating you, treating you, and also causing you pain, but also relieving the pain. It's, it's a very, very yeah. complicated thing. Um, and so we do have to honor that memory that is a very real memory and a very real relationship, but also put it in the context of it from Mengele's perspective, which is that these children are disposable. A, a, a very good friend of mine who's now unfortunately passed away uh, wrote a book called Children of the Flames, which is about about the twins and this this phenomenon of the ambivalence. Um, I mean, their the relationship with Mengele was was very very complex. There was a question up here. Yes. I mean, I think it's both, right? Like, Veritz, I think, was, a, was one who was rationalizing what he was doing. You hear it in the play as his son is telling the story of, you know, he tries to leave and people say, no, don't go. You know, he is 
consistently trying to rationalize, well, if I don't, I mean, and you see this, this is a phenomenon that you see outside of camps that you, whenever anybody is trying to rationalize something that they know is wrong, if I leave, somebody worse will come. Um, I can at least protect these people. Um, it is absolutely part and parcel of the way that people rationalize doing horrific things. And so that's not limited and not to just doctors. doctors. And no, not just no. doctors, right? Um, politicians, yeah. all over. <laughs> Everyone rationalizes that way. Um, and then you have the, the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and some of them believed it and some of them didn't. And there's no, I mean, you don't get arrested for violating the Hippocratic Oath. And when everything in your world, the scholarly community, the political community, everyone that you're interacting with is looking to you and honoring the work that you're doing, it's very, very easy to convince yourself that, that, that you're doing the right thing. You know, Mengele began his medical studies at a, just about the time the Nazis uh, took power in Germany. And his choice, he was not only a physician, he also had an advanced, an advanced degree in medicine, which allowed him to, to a career in teaching and, and potentially leading a, um, a um, laboratory. But he also had a PhD in anthropology. And these two fields um, were privileged under the Nazis because they provided the, the um, kind of scientific basis for, for Nazi ideology. Um, and they were privileged because they got better funding and the people who practiced those fields uh, were elevated in status. And um, that was the, the context in which Mengele uh, began his professional studies and um, led him through his career. Um, and he believed it. I mean, Mengele was a committed, uh, we, we, it's hard to know that for sure, but that's the testimony of, of, of his colleagues who, who encountered him. Um, and it also comes out in, um, in his, in his uh, diaries and in an autobiographical novel that he had written about himself that was found after the body was discovered in Brazil, um, which I, have, I was able to get a copy of. So, um, yeah. I, I think one other thing that, that doesn't really come out in the play, I mean, they meant, it's mentioned a couple of times, but how very, very young these people were. Yeah. You know, Mengele was 32, Hawker was 32. I don't think anybody who's mentioned by name in the play is older than 44 years old. Um, the, the leadership, the command leadership is incredibly young. Many of them had come up as street fighters in the 20s. You know, uh, Hawker joins the part, or joins the SS in 33. Um, at that point, the, the Nazis had actually closed uh, the ability to apply for the party, to, to join the Nazi party, because they, didn't, they wanted to be able to separate the old guard from hangers on. And so when they open it up again in 37, Hawker immediately joins the party. Um, and he's not dissimilar from some of, I think Klauberg might be the only one who's older than that, uh, Carl Klauberg. Um, but and by and large, they also, uh, we saw some of the officers there, but in the chorus of criminals, the vast majority of those people are, are non-commissioned officers uh, and junior non-commissioned officers. Uh, Mengele was an SS captain. He wasn't some kind of high-ranking official. He was, um, you know, middle rank. Yeah, the, the reason I actually wrote the paper um, in undergrad that like, started this whole thing um, is that in the year 2000 there was a poll and the poll was, it was one of those like millennium internet polls and it was who, is the, who are the most evil people in the last millennium? And number one was Adolf Hitler, number two was Bill Clinton, it was, <laughs> it was 2000, people had feelings, and number three was Joseph Mengele. And I thought that's the most bizarre thing because Adolf Hitler did not know that Joseph Mengele right. existed. For sure. Yeah. Like, he was not that high ranking. <laughs> yeah. And he actually became much, much more notorious um, well after the war. I mean, except for the people who had encountered him uh, and his victims, he was unknown in, uh, in um, 1945. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, he lives under Jose Mengele for a while. He does, when he, when, when, when he decides to um, reject his cover name in, in Argentina in 1956, he, he takes the name Mengele back and he goes to the German embassy and said, look, I came in under a false name, but my, my real name is 
Yosef Mengele, and they gave him a passport. And uh, um, that changed, of course, after. Yeah, when Eichmann, Eichmann gets discovered, then you go yeah. deep underground. Then he went deep underground. But he, but then he but, also and, becomes and notorious. He was, and he was right not to have, I mean, changing his name didn't threaten him at all because no one was looking for him. Right until 1950, 1959, right. and then, And then when you and others discover the body, it's, I, if I remember correctly, it was on the cover of People magazine. Yeah. And so that the, shows a huge change in the kind of historical memory of this man. When I, when I first started the investigation, we thought Mengele was still alive. He had been dead for a few years. But, um, and my first question, I always tried to do this, was to, to kind of bring context to... Um, to the investigation. One of the things I decided was, well, how, the name Joseph Mengele, is, is, it, a, is it a common name? Because if you're looking for someone after the war, if it's a common name, it might be more difficult. And I found in the records that there were 17 soldiers in both the Wehrmacht and the SS with the name Joseph Mengele. Um, two were born on the same, in the same year, two born in the same town. So it was, if you think about the, um, that this was not some unique character, uh, even with his name. And his family was very well known, yeah. very well connected, had a lot of money. Yep, very privileged childhood. I, I wish we, we will we'll take one more question. I just uh, I, I think we're going over, but yes, sir, please take the last one. So just can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was if the, the physicians were there to make a choice about who was capable of work and who could be exploited before they were murdered. It, it was not a, a serious examination. It, it was if you were old, you were dead. If you were sick in any way, you were dead. If you were a, a mother with children, you were dead. Um, if you were, um, and, and there would be sometimes a, an exchange. Uh, are you pregnant? And if you were pregnant, you were dead. Um, so it wasn't, that was the, the first selection. So that was basically, um, you didn't need to be a physician to do that. Later on, when they, they combed through the camp, the people who had been actually registered in the camp and who were working on, in, in labor details, um, in order to um, make room the, the, for other inmates to come in, they would call the camp population. And there they had actually, the physicians met and they had some standards, uh, the, the amount of fat on the body, there were there's certain indices of, of longevity and illness that were, that were applied. Well, and if you listen, so there are two things. Um, one is that the Lily Jacob album actually helps corroborate survivor testimony with this. Survivor testimony has always been, it was very fast. You know, you blink and then you don't see your family again. And what you see in the Lily Jacob album is you actually see people staggered walking away from the selection. And you can kind of time the average amount of time it takes to walk that distance shows you that it's about 1.5 seconds, the, the pointing, kind of a... um, if they don't stop the line to have any sort of discussion back and forth. But what you also hear and, and is corroborated by survivors is that there were lots of different techniques that survivors used to try to show their health. And so sometimes that would be whispered from a prisoner, a member of the Sonderkommando, as people were getting off the train, like, hand your children to your mother. You know, a young woman with traveling with young children would be told to hand her children off to their grandmother with the idea that at least you might survive. Um, and then in the barracks, um, you know, slap your cheeks for a while. Try to get some sort of um, color into your face in order to convince the, the Nazi doctors that you, um, that you are healthy enough to continue. So there's a whole slew of different strategies that prisoners would use to try to stay alive. Uh, did you have a... Well, I just wanted to... to um, you mentioned FASB before, the... the that's sponsoring the talkbacks. And I, I'm on the board of FASB and been very involved with it for many years. And um, I hope you'll read the literature. But I also, uh, one of the, the lessons that I came out of my, my study of Mengele and, and the book that I wrote um, was this, this notion of barriers and limitations that, um, 
the profession should impose on their members. And if you think about today, um, with the new technology we have, uh, you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner to, to, ex to practice CRISPR gene editing. You don't have to be a millionaire. You can buy the stuff online. And just imagine what Mengele would have done with, mm. with, um, with those tools. Um, so the importance of, of people understanding what their responsibilities are when they have that kind of power, um, very important. I couldn't have uh, thought, I couldn't think of a better way to end that conversation. I, three quick things. Um, again, giant thank you to FASB for curating and, and bringing you out and, and allowing these conversations to happen. Um, thank you to Dr. Marwell, to Dr. Erbelding for being here. Um, and if I may, uh, if, if there's uh, one thing that you take home, it's I'm going to echo uh, Becky's earlier heed to search every closet <laughs> and basement and attic space and, and really engage with and, and look what you have uh, there because it's, uh, it, our tie to tenuous, uh, history is so tenuous and everything that gets thrown away is a, a potential treasure lost. Um, thank you both again. Thank you all for being here tonight. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>